Hi guys, uh, welcome to our week 12 meeting. Uh, let me see who's here. I can see right now. There we go. Uh, Andrew's here, very really good. Robert, Victoria, with only three people. It's gonna be a small meeting today. All right, um, so let's get started. Let's cover two chapters for this week. Sharing. All right, so first, let's do our chapter 16, oligopoly. Now, uh, for oligopoly, so make sure you know what oligopoly is. So first thing first is something called con concentration ratio. It shows you the percentage of the market total output supplied by the, large, the four largest companies. Um, now, we have this uh, chart over here. So first, video game console, the top four companies supply the uh, the hundred percent market, so you can think about Sony. Who else make game consoles? Uh, Microsoft, that's Xbox, and then Nintendo Wii. Um, I can't think of the fourth one. So pretty much those three company covers one hundred percent market, and then credit cards. That's almost ninety nine percent. So you have your uh, Discover, your Master, your Visa, your uh, American Express, and Discover. So those com those four companies. Uh, covers 99% uh, of the market. So that's called concentration ratio. Okay, all right. Uh, let's, now for oligopoly. So oligopoly is a market structure where only a few sellers offer similar or identical product. So uh, for the game console market, for the credit card market, for cell phone market, uh, those are all oligopolies. Now, also, guys, know what's a game theory. So, game theory is study of, of how people behave in a, a strategic situation. Now, if any of you guys want to go into uh, economics for your bachelor degree or major in economics, uh, more than likely you would take a class called uh, game theory. Now, I took it when I was in senior year in college. <laughs> when I when I was signing up, I was so excited. I was thinking, man, finally, you know, you can go to school to play games. Um, but no, that's not the case. Uh, actually, you learn how to set up uh, dif different game situations where participants can behave uh, you know, in the game. So you can learn how people behave within the certain situations. Um, all right, so that's game theory. Now let's look at our example over here. So we have a small town which has 140 residents. Uh, and then the service that's being offered is going to be cell phone service. <laughs> So um, we have two companies. We have AT and T and Verizon. So they are competitors, and then we call this market structure a duopoly. So du duopoly is whenever you have a market with only two firms, that's called duopoly. So oligopoly is a few companies, and duopoly is only two companies. Now we have our revenue and cost and profit over here. So uh, again, revenue is your um, price times quantity, and cost. Uh, I think I think so. Uh, what ten? Not so. 10, was ten dollar for marginal cost in the question before? And then profit. So ten times quantity. That's your cost. Um, and then your profit. Just use your total revenue minus total cost. They equal to your profit. Um, so if you look at this chart over here or this graph, uh, this chart table um, for for a company who is a monopoly you know remember from monopoly last chapter is a market with only one company so if a company is a monopoly in this market structure uh, then if they try to maximize profit at the highest profit you're gonna be end up over here so this is a monopoly I'll put and then um, if you're a company in perfect competition, um, so which means market is very competitive, you have many, many companies, then you're gonna end up over here. Because in my, remember in the long run, nobody make any profit in perfect competition. So this is a two extreme case over here. And monopoly, the market is not competitive at all. In perfect competition, the market is 100% competitive. So for duopoly, is where do you end up? Do you end up in perfect competition, or do you end up in company like a monopoly? So let's look at our two companies. 
Uh, let's look at some definitions first. So definitions for, for first, collusion. Collusion is agreement among firms in the market about quantity to produce or price to charge. So suppose for our two company here, at and Verizon, let's suppose they come to agreement. Now remember in this table before, we said at 18 or at a uh, price of 40, go back, at price of 40 at a monopoly output, our profit is maximized. So let's suppose at and Verizon, they come to agreement. It says, um, you know what, let's just split the market half half. So each company agreed to charge a price of 40. And then for the quantities, um, the total output is 60. And then we have two companies. So each company supply 30 quantities. Therefore, each company profit will be 1800 divided by two, which is 900 each. So therefore, the the market is split half and half between two companies now. So that's called collusion. So if two companies come together, agree to what kind of price to charge or what type of quantity to produce, that's called collusion. Um, and then this collusion or any type of collusion, we call it a cartel. So cartel is a group of firms acting in unison. So example, at and Verizon in this case over here, when they form a collusion, this will be a cartel. And then uh, now, <laughs> I know when you think of a when you heard a cartel, you're probably thinking of drug cartel. Uh, but in economics, those are not really cartel. Um, the biggest cartel out there is a group called OPEC. So OPEC is the biggest cartel. So they're the oil, um, petroleum um, exporting countries. Um, so what they do, they, they come together once a month, decide how much uh, total produ production to produce. Therefore, they have agreement about the market quantity and then therefore influence the price of the market. So therefore, the OPEC organization is a cartel, okay? All right, so, so if each company produce a um, 30 unit, the price is not, I mean, the profit for each company is 900. Uh, now that's a collusion. Now let's suppose um, at t want to cheat. So at t decided instead of producing 30, at t will produce 40. So let's see what happens over here. So if, if at t produce 40, and then Verizon still produce at uh, 30, then at t uh, so total output, so total market output, will be 30 from Verizon, 40 from at t that will be a total of 70. Now, according to this table over here, when the quantity is 70, our price will be 35. So price of 35. And let's find out each company's profit. So for at t um, their price is $35. Their quantity, at t produce 40. So at and ts revenue will be, Let's see how much this is. So fourteen hundred. That's eighteen T's revenue. And then the marginal cost is ten dollar each. So ten dollar times forty. So this is four hundred. That's eighteen T's revenue uh, cost. And the AT&T profit is fourteen hundred minus four hundred. This is gonna be one thousand dollar profit. Now for for the um, for AT&T before they were increasing the output when they're still still producing at thirty, the profit was only nine hundred. So which means if AT&T produced forty, the profit uh, is one thousand, which is better than nine hundred. So which means at and have an incentive to produce a 40 unit. Because they're producing 40 unit, they are better off than 30, 30 unit. Um, now for Verizon, if Verizon also do the same thing, uh, so if Verizon also produce 40 and then at and produce only 30, Verizon also end up with a higher profit. So both company here have an incentive to produce a little more. Uh, but however, if both company produce more, uh, let's see what happens, okay? Uh, let me do a split screen. One, one note. All 
All right, so we said before, if uh, if both company produce at 40, uh, the profit, um, here, let me go back to the previous slide. All right, so at t One at t quantity is 40, the profit is 1,000, and then for Verizon, What's the horizon we were talking at? Let me see. Yeah, it is horizon. So horizon is still produced as 30. Let's see how much horizon profit is. Now, when both companies produce at 30, horizon profit is 900. But if at and produce at 40, Verizon profit wouldn't be 900 anymore. Verizon profit will be changed. So your Verizon, the price goes down to $35. This still produces 30 unit. So 35 times 30, their total revenue. And use my calculator. $1050. And then their cost is 10 times 30. That's going to be 300. So profit is going to be 750. So profit of 750. So now, vice versa, if AT&T produce 30, their profit will be 750. And then Verizon produce at 40, their profit will be at 1,000. So each company want to produce a little more because you produce more, your profit is higher. Now for the next scenario, let's suppose each company do decide to produce more. So both companies produce at 40. So at t quantity of 40, and then Verizon, quantity of 40. And let's see what happens. So if both companies produce more, then the total output and according to this chart over here, when we produce 80, um, the price is only as $30. Let me just go away. All right, so, so let's find out the profit for at t first. So for at t the price is 30 quantity is 40. So for at t you want to, so for total revenue is 30 times 40, that's 1,200. And then total cost is 10 times 40, that's 400. And then profit will be 800. And then for Verizon, the profit will be the same. So both company, the profit is 800. All right, so according to this, that doesn't matter what the company does. Uh, if both company decide to produce 40, then both company end up with a profit of 800. Um, so which means, you know, before when they're producing both 30, it was better than both producing at 40. So this little situation is a demonstration of uh, game theory that when, company, uh, when one company cheat, the other one doesn't cheat, then the cheater, the cheating company is better off but if both companies cheat together, then both are uh, worse off altogether, okay? Uh, does anybody have any question at this point right now? All right, so no questions, uh, let's keep going. So um, now, when, the one we just talked about when both companies cheat together, that's called Nash equilibrium. So it's a situation in which both uh, economic participants interact with one another and they each choose the best strategy. Now, Nash Equilibrium was named after an economist named John Nash. Now, if you guys ever watch a movie called um, It's a Beautiful Mind, um, from what's the actor's name? I think it's Russell Crowe. Um, he played the mathematician named John Nash. The, this theory is named after him. So. So for our example here, um, let me show you this one over here. So for game theory, um, you're gonna learn something called a prisoner dilemma. 
Now for prisoner dilemma, it's just a game when, um, suppose we have two people here. Now let's suppose we have me and Victoria. All right, so Victoria and me. Guys, I'm going to show you the very basic president dilemma and show you how this works. Okay, so guys, suppose between me and Victoria, uh, we are a partner in crime. So every day after class, we go out to the parking lot, break into people's cars. Okay, um, and then let's suppose we broke into at least ten different cars, but on our eleventh breaking, we got caught in action. So, um, so which means the the DA and then the HPD, they have evidence on one break in. But uh, they also suspecting they were broken into at least ten different cars. So um, the DA decided to separate us into two different rooms and then offer each person a deal. So we have a choice either to confess or not to confess. Now, if both person <laughs> confess, um, then the DA has evidence on all eleven breaking in. So which means each of us will be in jail for a very long time. So let's suppose we we both in jail for ten years each. Now, if both choose not to confess, then DA only has evidence on one breaking. So we both stay in jail for two years each. Now the interesting part is this two empty cell over here. Um, let's suppose uh, Victoria decide not to confess, and I had to confess. So because I decided to confess, I'm, I, I get off easy. So I get only half year. And then Victoria, I'm sorry, but you've been in jail for 15 years. All right, now vice versa. Let's suppose Victoria decided to confess, and then I decided not to confess. Then I'll be in jail for 15 years, and then she'll be in jail only for half years. All right, so this payout then looks like this is the best outcome. So both people choose not to confess. Um, but this is where the Nash equilibrium comes in. That sometimes the cheater is always better off, and this is what it means. Let's let's look at this outcome. So suppose, um, guys, suppose I know Victoria very well. I know she's very honorable. She will never sell me out. So I know for sure Victoria will always choose not to confess. So if Victoria chooses not to confess, and I choose to confess, I get half year. If I choose not to confess, I get two year. So if if Victoria choose not to confess, then for me confession is better because it's less than two. Now let's suppose the other the other way. Let's suppose the Victoria I know I know her very well. That I know she will she will always sell me out regardless of what happens. So I know for sure Victoria will go for a confession. Then if she decides to confess and I, I decide also to also to confess, I get ten years. But decide not to confess. I got fifteen years, so ten is better than fifteen. So I did. I choose to confess when she chooses to confess. So regardless what she does, when she chooses not to confess, I choose to confess. When she decides to choose to confess, I also choose to confess. So confession is called the dominant strategy. That means regardless what she does, I would choose to confess, and then. Since I have my dominant strategy, so I always go for confession. And then same for her; she will always go for confession. So both people go for confession. Then we end up over here. So ten years each. Now, even though this looks like the worst outcome of the all, but this is called the Nash equilibrium. So it's when both parties decide to cheat, and then we end up at a worst case scenario. This is called the Nash equilibrium, and this game is called the prisoner dilemma. All right, makes sense. Okay, so we have Bonnie and Clyde over here. So same deal. Um, so let's look at this payout. If Bonnie decide to remain silent, then if Clyde decide to confess, he go free. If Clyde decide to uh, remain silent, he get one years in jail. So so go free is better. And then if Bonnie decide to confess. Then if Clyde also a client also confess, he get eight years. If Clyde not to confess, he get twenty years. So this is also better. So which means for Clyde, regardless what Bonnie does, confession is better. And then for Bonnie, same deal. Confession is always better than not to confess. So both party end up over here, and both party get eight years each. And this is called a Nash equilibrium.
All right, make sense? We can skip this, not that important. Yeah, I think this is it for this chapter. Does anybody have any questions for this chapter? All right, if no question, let's continue. Let's do next chapter. Yeah, guys, my wife is calling me. She wants to FaceTime, but she can go back later. All right, chapter 18. All right, so remember this from a long time ago. Um, oh, okay, go ahead, Victor, what's your question? All right, so remember this from a long time ago, factor production. Um, is input required to produce good and service and it has three categories. Um, uh, we have land, labor, and capital. So um, capital is requirement, uh, is its equipment and structures used to produce good and service. Uh, my economic Star Trek speech open to the general public. Oh, okay, so, um, okay, <laughs> I didn't. I haven't announced this yet. So guys, um, if you're interested on um, this Friday, I have a, uh, a special lecture um, um, at Lone Star. Uh, the topic is not, it's the economics of Star Trek. Um, it is open to public. So if you guys want to come, or if you want to bring, bring your friends with you, uh, we'll be, we're going to be in CLA 114. Um, the time is going to be from 12.30 to 1.30. And then make sure to come early. There will be pizza um, at the event. So, uh, so come, uh, uh, come, you know, first come, first serve. So come early, okay? But yeah, they are open to the public. Um, let me see what's important about this chapter. All right, so let's look at Farmer Jack. So Farmer Jack here um, is in a perfectly competitive market. He hires workers in a perfectly competitive labor market, so anybody can work. Um, and he wants to decide how many people to hire. Now we learned this before the production function. So uh, it's how much do you produce given how much your uh, your output is for each worker. I believe this is what chapter 10 or chapter no chapter 13 we learned before. So the production function shows you how much you produce by each level of output workers. Uh, and then we have our production line. And the first thing we learn is something called the MPL is the marginal product of labor. It's the increase in the amount of output from additional unit of labor. So for our table over here, if you find a difference between each level of output. That is the MPL. So when you hire zero workers, you have zero output. But when you hire one worker, you have 1,000 output. Two workers, um, the difference is 800. So the additional worker gave you 800, 800 unit of output. Three worker gave you 2,400, so the difference is 600. Uh, four workers, 400. And then, oh, that's a zero. And then five worker is 200. So that's your MPL. Is the the actual production from each level of new worker, okay? And that's the formula, it's a change. So remember the triangle is then for change. So changing output divided by changing labor. Also know what's the VMPL, is the value of marginal output, of marginal part of labor, use the price of the output times the marginal product of labor 
will get you how much um, contribute, like dollar amount contribution can each additional worker bring to the company. So for this case, it is, uh, doesn't say what the price is. The MKL does number we're happy for. Uh, So the, I think the P is $5. So five times 1,000 is 5,000. And then it goes from there, okay? And your VMPL curve is always downward sloping. The reason why it's always downward sloping is because your uh, your MPL is always downward sloping. Too much. But this downward sloping VMPL curve is also the demand curve for labor. So once you have a demand curve for labor, and then you put out your wage, so wage is $2,500 per person, then you're going to have your total number of workers required or desired. So the equilibrium number of workers three. Okay. It's a very simple concept, just like before. Um, let me see what else is important to talk about. This chapter is pretty easy. Mostly definitions, um, not that much important concept. Oh, this is important. So when company decide to hire laborers, the marginal cost will equal to the wage of each worker divided by the marginal product of labor for each worker. Okay. I'll know that. Let's see what else is important. Uh, I guess not much important information for this chapter. Oh, by the way, I think this is the last chapter we have. Um, oh, no problem, Robert. I guess you the extra points for this week. Okay. Um, more definitions, know what's a monopsony. Monopsony is where the market only has one buyer, there's a monopsony. Let me see what else I need to be covered for this week. Yeah, I think that's it, guys. Okay, so um, I guess this is it <laughs> for this chapter. It's not that much important information. Um, but your previous chapter, the oligopoly is more challenging. So make sure to be careful and ask me questions. All right, so guys, um, let's finish this week, but um, let's talk about next week. Now, next week is the holiday. Um, so, you know, if you notice that the school, most school don't even open on Wednesday and Thursdays, and that's our meeting week. So we won't have any, uh, we won't have any meetings next week, but we're gonna resume after the holiday. Okay, so guys, um, no meeting next week, um, but there will be there will be another meeting after the holiday. And then if you guys have any, any questions, send me an email or send me um, send me um, Google Plus, and I'll answer them as soon as possible. All right, so guys, um, does anybody have any question at this point? Any questions? Let me wait for a second. All right, so uh, guys, no questions. I will see you in two weeks. All right, happy holidays. See you later.